Welcome, I'm Bill Brown from Brookings Mountain West. Welcome to our inaugural lecture of the academic year, the start of our fourth year here. If we can, those of us who've been here for all four of them find that a little daunting to think about. Uh, appreciate a crowd. Who knew that a lecture on putting Nevada in perspective, state and local budgets, would be popular in a city in a region <laughs> that was ground zero for the foreclosure and unemployment crisis, or, or the Great Recession as we now call it. Uh, but we're going to solve all those problems tonight, right? <laughs> uh, again, uh, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are new to our lectures and that, I'll, I'll point out a couple obvious things. One is you can't get out on the far sides here. So uh, if we have any late arrivals, they may be stepping over your toes trying to find a seat. Uh, some of you picked up outside. We have uh, the schedule of our lecture series. Uh, it's also on our website. Please feel free to pick one up on the way out. Uh, I'll say more about our upcoming lectures uh, as we close tonight. Uh, we also have uh, copies of our quarterly economic analysis that we do of the region, the Mountain Monitor. Uh, we just published uh, yesterday, it came out, which looks at the second quarter of this year and uh, starts to show the the signs of recovery. As we all know, this city and region have been lagging in that recovery compared to other cities in the region and other parts of the country. And we are fortunate tonight to have a colleague from Brookings out, Tracy Gordon, a fellow in economic studies, who's making her first visit to us as a Brookings scholar, but not her first visit to Las Vegas. She's been busy this week and will continue to be busy uh, participating in UNLV classes, working with UNLV faculty, giving guest lectures. Those of you who, who've been with us before, we launched a Brookings minor here for UNLV undergraduates. Do we happen to have any of those students here? I, I hope they're in class. <laughs> uh, but one of the results of our partnership has been this minor, which uh, UNLV graduates can take a series of courses taught by UNLV faculty and Brookings scholars. Uh, and, and public policy, and we're developing those courses as we speak, but yet another contribution we're trying to make to our community. So I'm going to let Tracy get started because she has a lot to say, and our audiences always have a lot of questions, so I hope you're ready. Well, and I definitely want to hear from you as well. So thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. As someone who studies state and local governments, I welcome every opportunity to get out of Washington or maybe a collective dozen people actually understand that states exist. I'm particularly glad to get back to the West. I'm from California originally, and as Bill mentioned, I've been to uh, Nevada and Las Vegas a couple of times, but I've been very surprised and interested in some of the things that I've learned on this trip. This region seems very dynamic, and I really have been especially pleased to see the community building that's going on around Brookings Mountain West, and so I, I hope I can come back sometime. So. Um, I'm going to be talking about what happened during the uh, financial crisis. First, I'm going to talk about why state and local governments matter. Um, this is some of the education that I have to do in uh, the District of Columbia a little bit. Um, how they fared in the Great Recession. And then I'm going to talk about what happened in Nevada and then what's next for this sector. So why does state and local government matter? Um, this graph shows a breakdown of sort of where your tax dollars go. Uh, where they're spent. So for the latest year that we have available, 2011, the total spending of the government sector, federal, state, and local, was about 36% of GDP. And you can see that that's higher than average, and that shows basically the response to the recession. Um, the average uh, since 1960 is closer to about 30% of GDP. Of that total, the share that the state and local government sector spends from their own resources was about 11% in 2011. Um, but that's a little bit misleading if we want to think about goods and services that are actually consumed by people or domestic discretionary spending. So let's take out the grants that the federal government spends uh, or the money that it transfers to state and local government. That's about 17% of the federal budget. And let's allocate those to the state and local sector where those dollars are ultimately spent. So that brings the federal red line down to the green line and it brings the state and local purple line up to the blue line. Well, let's also take out national defense on the theory that that's not goods and services that are actually consumed by people 
in the United States. That's a different function, an important function of government, but not directly comparable to what state and local governments do. Well, that brings the federal share down to about 18% of GDP, the uh, orange line. So it's still higher than the state and local share, including grants, which is about 15% in the last year for which we have data. But you can see that if we go back to 1960 again, take the longer view, there were several episodes in US history where the state and local sector basically dominated government. It was where most services were provided in this country. And if you think about the things that we typically think of as government, education, healthcare, most of that is actually provided at the state and local level. It's where government, uh, where the rubber meets the road, I often say. State and local governments are also big engines of growth. They're about 12% of the economy. They uh, create one out of seven jobs. They're the single largest employer in the country, bigger than manufacturing, bigger than healthcare, bigger than retail sales. On average, since 1930, uh, they've contributed about a third of a percentage point to real annual GDP growth. Um, unfortunately, in the recession, you can see they were actually a drag on growth. They were detracting from growth. Um, but on, in general, they're a big part of the economy and they contribute to our economic well-being. So you can also say that they were hard hit in the Great Recession. In particular, even though GDP contracted by about 5%, state taxes were especially hard hit, and they fell by about 17% at their lowest point. Um, so state taxes are very responsive to what happens in the economy, and states in particular were hit very hard in the Great Recession. Because states are required to balance their budgets, unlike the federal government, uh, what happened was we saw big budget gaps open, or gaps between the revenues coming in and the spending going out. And this is a problem. So you can see that it's bigger, uh, this problem, than in the previous recession. Cumulatively, the total gap that states faced was about $550 billion over the course of the recession. What made this especially troubling was if you look at the red bars, the red portions of the bars, um, those are the gaps that opened up after a budget was already adopted. So like in Nevada, when legislators had to return to a special session to find new cuts or new revenues, um, this is after they already thought that they were done, they had already made all of their bargains, and yet the economy kept deteriorating and revenue forecasts were increasingly out of whack with reality. And so in 42 states, a record number of states, lawmakers and governors had to return to the budget and, and find new savings. The federal government also stepped in to help. So this is the Recovery Act, or the stimulus. Um, and I've broken out spending under the Recovery Act under three categories, fiscal relief for state governments, direct income assistance and services to households, and infrastructure or technology uh, investment. And I should mention that this blue portion also includes tax cuts for individuals and households. So what was unusual about the Recovery Act is that it actually directed an unprecedented amount of relief to state and local governments, about $175 billion, which uh, could be used for flexible purposes like bridging their budget gaps and preventing teacher layoffs um, or cuts in services, as long as states maintain their previous levels of spending on things like Medicaid and education. Um, so this is really unusual in terms of its scale, in terms of its speed. This aid reached state and local governments much faster, much faster than in previous recessions. Um, and in terms of the way it was designed, there were a lot more reporting requirements involved, and maybe that's something we can talk about later. Um, so now, state revenues are improving. So this is at the depths of the recession over here. And you can see this is that 17% figure I was showing you earlier. Income taxes fell even further, 27% at their low point. Um, sales taxes were actually the first to go. They dropped ultimately about 10%. Um, but you can see they fell first, as you probably remember here in Nevada. Um, the income tax ultimately fell harder. So taxes improved for a while. They were having double digit gains, and that was very good. The, le the latest data that we have available suggests that taxes are growing at about 3% uh, right now compared to where they were about a year ago. So the growth rate is moderating, and that's a source of some concern. It's not those double-digit increases that we were seeing for a little while. Meanwhile, at the local level, basically property taxes are finally catching up to home values. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. But just as the state picture is improving, the local picture is worsening. So local taxes are dropping about 2%. And this is very unusual. So local taxes are predominantly property taxes. Um, and in general, the property tax is a very healthy tax. It doesn't really dip. It doesn't go negative very often. Uh, it can not grow as fast as usual, but it doesn't usually go negative. So the average growth rate is about 6%. Now it's declining about 2%. So this is very worrisome for local governments, which are also facing cuts in state aid. That's one way that states balance their budget was by cutting aid to local governments. 
So we see this as, uh, as a macroeconomic concern because job cuts are continuing in the state and local sector. So even though the private sector has been rebounding since about the second quarter of 2010, the cuts are continuing in state and local governments. And here I've broken them out by sector between basically education and not education. So you can see the green line at the top, state education jobs for a while were protected because of the stimulus and because that's a difficult area to cut. Also, I should mention state education includes higher education. So a lot of people were actually returning to school or trying to tool up uh, to get a better job. Um, and so that beca it became a difficult area to cut positions in as well. However, state non-education fell quite a lot. So these are things uh, that are perhaps uh, you know, less glamorous like the DMV, but ultimately, you know, vital services that we all use. Um, and local jobs have been falling in education and non-education. So Nevada really stands out. That's one reason I was very pleased to get to come here and talk to people and learn more about what's ha been happening in this state. Uh, it was actually among, the, it was the worst in terms of private sector job losses. Um, so that's the red line at the very bottom. And at the, at the low point in 2009, it was losing about 8 to 10 percent of jobs compared to where it had been the previous year um, uh, in each quarter. Um, you can see that other states that were also kind of riding the housing boom were similarly affected. So that would be states like Florida, which is the kind of orange line, or California, my home state, the gold line. Um, but then other states like North Dakota, the green line, they were doing just fine because of natural resources, because of fracking in particular. And so they experienced very little drop in jobs, and in fact, a big increase recently. And also the District of Columbia, where I live now, didn't experience as much of a drop because of the federal government, and they were somewhat protected from these kinds of uh, cycles. On the other hand, there are states like Michigan, the blue line, which was already not doing very well at the start of the recession, which is on sort of a long-term uh, downward e economic trajectory, or per although perhaps hopefully uh, turning up now. But they've been, their peak year of revenue was actually 2000, um, so they really never quite came out of the previous recession. So beyond private sector job losses, Nevada also stands out in terms of public sector job losses. So this shows states according to their, their losses in each area. Um, and you can see Nevada's down here um, having lost about 8% of the private sector <coughs> jobs between October and December, uh, basically peak to trough 2008 to 2011. And then their state and local uh, losses are about 11%. Uh, so they really stand out from other places, although the average for all states you can see is negative on both dimensions. Uh, Nevada stands out in terms of persistent, persistent unemployment. Um, the employment rate is still about 12 percent, but down from its peak of 14 percent. So that's a good thing. Uh, there are other states like New Jersey and New York that are still at their recession peak. They don't have any of those blue bars showing the maximum versus the current. The maximum is the current. Um, I should say also Nevada stands out in terms of persistent unemployment. So uh, these are folks that are working part time or fewer hours than they would like because they can't get a full time job. And by that measure, the unemployment late rate is closer to 22 percent. Uh, Nevada stands out in terms of home price declines. Again, they're the red line. So Nevada didn't rise as far as, uh, or at this point we're talking Las Vegas, but the same is true if we look at a statewide index. So Nevada didn't rise as, as far as Phoenix, um, but it fell farther. Um, meanwhile, cities that never experienced the housing boom, like Cleveland, just kept coming along. Um, so they didn't have the bust, but they didn't quite have the boom either. Nevada also stands out in terms of budget gaps. So these are estimates, and I should say this is an estimate of the size of the problem that lawmakers are facing at the beginning of the budget cycle. So it's difficult to compare across states because each state has a different way of calculating revenue forecasts and expenditure forecasts, and it's also a given snapshot at a, at a fixed point in time. Um, but these are numbers expressed as a share of total spending. So just to give you a sense of the, the size of the problem that they were confronting. So at its worst, Nevada was looking at a gap between revenues and expenditures of about 54 percent of the state general fund in a single year. And this is you know, especially tricky to estimate in Nevada given the bi biennial budgeting cycle. Um, so these numbers can bounce around a little bit. I've also seen 45 percent estimated. Um, but basically, Nevada was always kind of vying for first place with Arizona, which had a, a peak budget gap of about 39 percent. Um, so it was quite a big problem that the state had to face. So what happened exactly in Nevada? Well, sales taxes, as I mentioned earlier, were the first to go, although ultimately for the rest of the country, income taxes ultimately fell uh, harder. 
But in Nevada, uh, you sort of got a preview because of the state's dependence on the sales tax. So the sales tax fell by about 13%. Total taxes fell by about 9%, even though personal income fell by less than that, only 7%. Um, so that shows that people were really cutting down on their consumption, especially of durable goods. Retail sales fell, and as a result, sales taxes fell. And I should say it's not just um, the individuals and their personal consumption, but also the housing sector to the extent that it relies on people making big purchases that go into construction. That also shows up in uh, states' bottom lines and their sales taxes. Um, so the fact that Nevada was affected first basically shows the state's reliance on the sales tax, its lack of an income tax, and also uh, what we're seeing now in Nevada in terms of local government shows that the state relies more on property taxes than other states in its region. So it relies on property taxes for about 19% of total state and local revenue and on sales taxes for about 28%. So it's different from California, which relies less on the property tax in particular because voters have repeatedly limited the property tax there. And the same is true in Oregon and Washington. Um, and then of course, California um, and Washington have income taxes, whereas uh, uh, Nevada does not. So. Uh, so Nevada actually looks a lot more like southwestern states, like Arizona, Texas, um, which also lacks an income tax. Um, and that's a policy decision about you know, what revenue sources you're going to go after. In general, having a more diversified portfolio can help you. Um, on the other hand, we've also seen that states that rely on the income taxes sort of rode that boom and bust, and they, they also had a big problem because of the volatility of that particular revenue source. And that's something we can talk about a little bit more later if you like. Um, so the sales tax was the first to go, and the state felt that, and now the property tax is going, and that's more of a local government concern. But a lot of people were wondering how come it took so long for the property tax to fall, given what we saw in that housing price graph that I showed you earlier. And partly that's just the way that the property tax works. So in this graph, you can see the dark blue line shows the market value of properties. That's much like the housing price index graph that I showed you. Um, but it takes a while for the assessed value, uh, the basis of your property tax bill, to actually change in response to the market value. So there's typically that lag. Uh, you can see it's almost the same shape, sort of superimposed and shift forward, because it takes a couple of years for assessments to catch up with property values. Um, property tax collections take even longer, because think of the, the cycle. Basically, the property tax bill goes out. People remit their payments. It takes a little while longer. Um, meanwhile, the property tax rate can change in Nevada, and it did change. So the rate was lowered because of a delayed response to increases in market values, um, and then it was increased for the same reason in reverse, basically. So as the base was falling, the response was to increase the rate to try to offset some of that loss which was not an option in California where the property tax rate is fixed. So you see the same dynamic in terms of assessed values um, showing a delayed response to market values, and that's particularly true in California because of a limit on how quickly assessed values can increase. Um, but California didn't have that option of increasing the tax rate, um, which sort of moderates the drop in property tax collections. So going back to the national picture, overall, how did states respond to this drop in revenues? Um, almost all of them cut spending, and they cut spending in the areas where they spend most of their money, which is predominantly health um, and education uh, and public welfare. So uh, they went where the money was. 34 states cut K-12 education, 43 states cut colleges and universities, 31 states cut health care. Um, and oftentimes, these were, these were pretty grim cuts. You know, um, well, I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, but going on to revenues, there were often a lot of headlines about the largest nominal tax increase or the largest state tax increase in history. It's important to note that that was in nominal dollars. So in 2010, uh, collectively, states raised taxes by $24 billion, which is the largest number on record. But if you express that as a share of their revenues that they actually collect, it was not out of line with previous recessions in the 1990s and in the 1980s. And in fact, it was less than those responses as a share of revenue collections. So something has shifted. Tax increases were less a part of the solution across the nation um, than in previous recessions. There were also gimmicks. Uh, in terms of how states balance their budgets. So remember I said that they're required to balance their budgets, but there's actually a lot of wiggle room in those rules. So some states require that governors submit a balanced budget. Um, others require that the legislature pass a balanced budget. 
and the more stringent states require that the budget be balanced at the end of the year. So they say if you have a deficit at the end of the year, tough luck, you're not allowed to borrow to cover that deficit. So that's the most binding type of rule. And that exists in fewer states than, than you often hear the statistic that all states except Vermont have a balanced budget requirement. In reality, there's some slippage there. And then even if there is a balanced budget requirement, there are things that states can do to sort of bring revenues forward and push, ex push expenditures out. So most famously, Arizona, for example, um, sold off its capital building and then leased it back. That's a way of pushing those expenditures into the future. It's a form of borrowing. Um, Illinois, for example, postponed um, or hasn't paid its bills, basically. They have a backlog of several billion dollars, and basically they're leaving local governments, vendors, and nonprofits left uh, holding the bag and having to figure out how to make ends meet. So in a sense, they're borrowing from their vendors. Um, states also typically borrow from special funds, so the part that they worry about balancing is the general fund or their largest discretionary funds. They might have special funds that are earmarked for special purposes like transportation. They can shift funds around to try to balance the general fund. That's another way of addressing the problem, but not really providing a sustained balance. It's sort of a phantom balance in a given year. Um, some states, like my home state, actually borrowed from taxpayers, so they increased income tax withholdings and then just had to give bigger refunds later on. Um, these are all fine strategies if you think that you're going to grow out of a recession quickly. Um, in this particular case, though, that, that wasn't uh, the writing on the wall. Everyone knew that it was going to be a, a protracted recession, a protracted downturn. Um, so similarly, you know, accelerating collections from corporate income taxes or providing an amnesty for corporations to settle up, um, but then the state might have to repay it later if it turns out that whatever dispute they had about actual amounts due, um, the court finds in the corporation's favor. And a lot of places assumed that there would be more federal funds than actually showed up, and that's sort of a rosy scenario, uh, which, to be honest, happens at the federal government level as well. Okay, so. Nevada was among the states that raised taxes. It increased taxes by between 5 and 7 percent as a share of its total revenues. Um, so that makes it stand out um, compared to a number of states which held the line and did not increase taxes or in fact tried to reduce taxes. On the other hand, it was not a big, among the biggest tax increasers, which were California and New York in terms of tax in increases as a share of revenues. And they did this by uh, the modified business tax, um, higher uh, taxes on uh, rooms and hotels, sales taxes, uh, gaming taxes. So it was a diverse set of solutions, uh, many of which were scheduled to expire um, and have been extended. And there's a question now as to whether they'll be extended again. I know the governor has said that he would like to continue them and use the funds for K-12 education. Um, so during the recession, Nevada, like a lot of states, went where the money is. They cut uh, health care, in particular Medicaid coverage for non-medical vision um, uh, for, for adults, for low-income adults. Um, and they cut payments to hospitals. They also uh, uh, eliminated a waiver for pregnant women to get additional uh, health care above a certain poverty level. So these are non-mandatory benefits from the federal government's perspective, and uh, the state just felt that it couldn't afford them at the time. Um, Nevada furloughed state employees about 12 days, which is the equivalent of a 5% pay cut, and there were cuts to K-12 and higher education. I know at the worst point in the budget crisis, the governor proposed a 36% cut to higher education. That didn't materialize, but there were significant cuts. Also, the state had established a pretty substantial rainy day fund, and it drew down those funds, which again is a perfectly reasonable thing to do in a crisis. Um, the only thing is, is you can only do that once. Um, and oftentimes when states do that, they enact rules about uh, requirements to do that again going forward. So they, and that's exactly what Nevada did. So they basically tighten the requirements to draw down those funds and they increase the requirements to contribute to the fund in good years. Um, and then in sort of a dramatic move, uh, there was a budget that had assumed some cuts to local aid. There was a, a, a state court that said that those cuts could not go forward, they were unconstitutional, and that ba basically negated a whole bunch of cuts, other cuts to local governments that would have been in the budget and uh, paved the way for extensions to those uh, sales and gaming taxes that I mentioned earlier um, uh, that were set to expire in June of 2011. Um, so that makes Nevada stand out. In another way, it was one of the few states, like Connecticut actually, which is in its bracket of uh, tax increases, that adopted a balanced solution to the budget crisis that both increased taxes and cut spending. So what's next for the country and for Nevada? Um, this is a graph of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank's uh, 
coincident indexes, which is a sort of composite measure of labor market in, uh, indexes or, or uh, statistics like non-farm payrolls. It's basically a summary of where we are now. So it's not looking to the future, it's not looking to the past, it's just where we are now based on the past three months. Um, and so based on this index, it looks like Nevada is still uh, you know, coming out of the recession, uh, whereas other states are poised to do slightly better, but Nevada also is not doing as poorly as some states that are in, term, in, the, in the middle of this long-term readjustment like Michigan, West Virginia. I should say also that at the, at the height of the crisis, this entire map was, was dark red. All states were having a very bad time. So the extent of green and sort of light red that we're seeing in this, is, in this graph is a big improvement. Um, if we look out a little bit farther, there's a lot of uncertainty right now for state and local governments because of things happening in Washington, because of uh, federal policy. And so one source of uncertainty is what's going to happen when we hit the fiscal cliff or these tax increases or spending cuts which are scheduled to go into action despite the fact that we're still recovering from the recession. Um, also, uh, you know, as, this, as the country comes up against the debt limit, there could be a whole slew of solutions, much like the previous negotiations, which resulted in $917 billion in cuts to discretionary spending, of which about 30% goes to state and local governments. So as the federal government finds itself more and more in a box, it often wants to cut this, this category of non-defense discretionary spending. So that excludes things like Medicare and Social Security, and it excludes defense. But it's money that goes often to state and local governments, um, 30, about 30 percent, for things like education, for disadvantaged kids, for things like transportation, environmental protection. So it might not be a huge part of state and local budgets, but it's often uh, the last discretionary dollar that mayors and governors are getting that they can direct to the purposes where they feel it's most needed. Um, so a lot of places are, are anticipating some pain from that. Um, also, as the federal government gets its fiscal house in order, it's looking to cut tax expenditures or spending that happens through the tax code. And one of those is the exemption of municipal bond interest. So if you buy a bond from the state of, well, if you buy a bond from the state of California and you are uh, subject to the income tax in California, you don't pay federal income tax, you don't pay state income tax on that bond. So if you were to buy a bond from Nevada, you would not be liable for uh, federal income taxes on that bond, which means that the state of Nevada can borrow more cheaply than it otherwise would be able to than, say, General Motors or, or a corporation. There's some talk of the federal government either capping or getting rid of that exemption, which some people worry would increase the cost of borrowing for state and local governments. Um, in any case, it could, it could lead to some disruption or changes in that market, especially for actually small issuers, not so much the state, but school districts and, and municipalities. Um, there's also talk of getting rid of or capping the deductibility of state and local taxes. So right now, you can deduct income taxes and property taxes or sales taxes that you've already paid from your federal tax bite. This is a way that the federal government basically helps out states and localities, but as they find themselves increasingly in a box, they might be cutting back that, that subsidy. Again, in the medium term, uh, governors are very worried about the increase in cost of health care. And this is even before health care reform and the Supreme Court decision making the Medicaid expansion optional. Um, I've actually taken this graph from a white paper that the state of Nevada prepared about whether to opt out of Medicaid. So in 2010, um, there was serious consideration, as in other states like even Washington, about opting out of Medicaid because in order to get the federal funds, you have to spend a certain amount of your money on these mandatory populations and mandatory benefits. So I mentioned a couple of examples of optional benefits like non-emergency, uh, non-medical vision care. You can drop those, but there's other things that you can't drop, and states were thinking it might be worth their while just to get out of the program entirely because of this escalation that's ramping up in Medicaid costs, and it's unclear where and how that's going to stop. Uh, there are a lot of pilot studies about managed care and alternatives um, to uh, the current system of financing and delivery, but it's not clear if those are going to bear fruit. So governors are very worried about this being the fastest growing section of their budget and not knowing um, where it's headed. Looking longer term, um, so states typically do maybe five-year forecasts at the outside. Uh, the federal government, the Go Government Accounting uh, Accountability Office, recently started developing a long-term forecast, much like the trustees for Social Security or Medicare, to look further, further out. So based on their model, they calculate that by 2060, there'll be a gap between revenues coming in and spending going out at the state and local sector uh, generally of about 2 to 4% of GDP. And the main drivers of this are healthcare costs, 
both the programs that states and localities operate, not just Medicaid, but things like public health and hospitals, um, but also the healthcare benefits that they provide for their employees and for their retirees, and for the pensions that they provide for their employees. So those are the two big drivers. But I should note, healthcare costs and aging of the population are also the main things that are leading to federal deficits. So it's a common challenge, it's a shared problem at all levels of government. So in the short term, Things are looking up, state revenues are improving. Actually, according to the recent report of the Economic Forum, which does forecasting for the state of Nevada, they're coming in above forecast, about 2.7% above forecast, and sales taxes in particular are coming in about 5% above forecast, so that's good news. Um, but local property taxes are flagging, and that's true across the country and in Nevada as well. Um, there's also this sort of uh, crossroads politically about what to do now that the money is coming back. Um, I heard a quote from Governor Brewer in Arizona saying, I don't want to hear the R word anymore, whereas R, where R means restoration or restoration of spending cuts that were undertaken in the recession. So Governor Sandoval has actually said kind of the opposite, that he's willing to uh, keep these taxes and think about trying to continue to fund K-12 education, but uh, that's going to be a politically fraught decision in a lot of states, what to do with the money coming in and how to avoid committing to ongoing spending uh, when the revenues might be ephemeral, as suggested by the double-digit increases now kind of moderating to these uh, low single-digit increases. And then finally, there are economic challenges facing the sector overall, which are compounded by uh, <laughs> political uncertainties, and especially at the federal level. Um, so it's a very interesting time to be working in this area, and I hope that you have a lot of questions and we can have a good dialogue. Thank you very much. Um, can we need to use a microphone? Hi, Pamela okay. Jeremy, but uh, I'm uh, Dr. Eric Young of uh, Islands, Utah. Uh, I'm very interested in your presentation. Uh, I, I've been proposing what I call a, a 10 3 1 rule, which uh, covering all uh, income tax and uh, capital gains and dividends, because you'd have to pay a minimum of that total cash flow, not just even what you call revenue or net income, but cash flow, and it seems, if I understand correctly, that the teachers here in Nevada, someone may be able to correct me, but they're proposing teachers union a 2% hmm. revenue tax, <clears throat> and the 10-3-1 is federal, state, local, and that would smooth out, again, it, you know, that would smooth out some uh, of these uncertainties and also have, you know, again, if there's any cash flowing into your area, at least you can get some of it, hmm. and uh, it's it's uh, sort of a it's and consider it should be in, like viewed as an alternate minimum or a minimum hmm. tax on cash flow. But what what do you think about that? And maybe I have that wrong with the teachers, but I certainly ardently support what they're trying to do. Basically, if that's what they're doing. So I think um, you know there there are several criteria for what constitutes a good tax system, and one of them, as I mentioned, is diversification. So you never want to put all of your eggs in one basket. On the other hand, you have to think carefully about what those eggs are, right? So uh, a lot of states were talking about adding new taxes um, to try to broaden their portfolio, but you know, especially with things like the income tax, you know, you have to be careful because that's a very volatile tax. Now, when it's good, it can be you know quite good. You can get quite a lot of revenue. And then that just means you have to manage it. You have to have some sort of a budgeting system like a rainy day fund to store those excess funds. So, um, but I would also just, you know, wonder out loud about sort of the political will to, you know, adopt any sort of wholesale new tax, um, you know, in this because climate. Pledges that are Something around, like that. Right. <laughs> uh, right behind you, Jeremy. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, the furloughs, it's, it's interesting it, it, as they look in the state at the furlough effect. Was that really just deflationary? I mean, the job has not been gone. I mean, the people that right. had to work at DMV right. or the other people that are furloughed, the, the work still is there. So mm -hmm. should that, mm -hmm. should we have looked at, or have you looked at mm -hmm. the impact if we had just said, mm -hmm. this is a deflationary time, we've got a lower cost. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right, so the, the benefit of a furlough is that it's not permanent. Um, so it gives you some flexibility. Basically, you're just, you're instituting a one year pay cut. Um, and so, you know, it's not quite as traumatic as, you know, cutting the branch off the tree um, for everybody um, in terms of having to rejigger the way you provide services or for the people who are affected. 
um, it is traumatic having to deal with a you know a twelve or a five percent pay cut in a given year. Um, but then the the good news is that's not sustained over several years. Um, but there's a lot of talk about whether this recession has led to sort of a, a right sizing of government. Or so the graphs that I was I was showing you were were showing sort of the peak to trough. Um, the peak being August of 2008. I'm not arguing that that was the, where we should get back to, just to show sort of if that was the right amount, which you know presumably that was the the result of political decisions and economic decisions that people were making. Um, we've gone a long way from that. There's a, another graph that I actually thought about showing, which is that real real state and local expenditures per capita have fallen in the past four years or so, um, which is not to say that. Um, you know, we were right then and we need to get back to that level, but it's hard to imagine people aren't going to notice that difference. Um, so if we were at some kind of equilibrium which was making people happy before, then, you know, presumably people will feel the effects of having, uh, you know, fewer workers as shown in that job cuts uh, graph, um, or they'll be glad that they didn't cut those people um, and, and furloughed them instead as a temporary solution. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, is it, it, it would the word back in Washington would the word mm -hmm. deflationary or deflation be a, have been a problem? Is that one of the reasons they didn't recognize what it is? Deflationary in the sense that you're cutting government. Um, you're, you're cutting what you're paying people. Yeah. The furlough is a cut in pay. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, no, I don't think it's any kind of semantic issue about deflationary versus furloughs. It's just this idea of um, you know it's it's tough to. It, it's tough to undertake any kind of permanent change, you know, whether it's adopting a new tax or a permanent spending cut. And so this was a way of trying to sort of moderate the pain somewhat and, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, you could have a furlough year after year. It gives you some flexibility as opposed to permanently getting rid of people and then perhaps having to hire them back when the revenues come back. Yeah, I almost look at the difference between in language between a corporate world mm -hmm. and, and the government world. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the corporate world, we, need, we still need to get the work done. Right, exactly. So and, productivity. And all of a sudden, government saying, "Well, we really don't need to get that much work done." I guess. Well, but productivity. I mean, if you think of productivity as just mathematically, it's the amount of output per you know worker that has gone up in the state and local sector, just like in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know measurement is is a bit of an issue. Honestly, the word deflationary. Nobody likes that word because we remember we were worried about a deflation saying, trap. Yeah, exactly. Sure, but, but exactly. Income deflation has been around since uh, 1980, except for a little bit of a bubble. How about um, in the state of Nevada, any changes to our tax codes have always been dead on arrival. But hmm. is there a state that um, does seem to have a, a fairly responsive, hmm. salutary tax um, hmm. revenue source that has, in a reasonable way, responded somewhat well to this kind of challenge? Mm -hmm. So I think in Nevada, I put Nevada in that camp of, I'm impressed by the bipartisan nature of the solutions that were reached here too, a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature. Um, you know, at the beginning of the recession, I remember there was a lot of talk about a day of reckoning both on the expenditure side in terms of figuring out, you know, what is the right size of government? What kind of outputs do we want? And what are we willing to pay for? And then on the revenue side, there was talk about fundamental tax reform. So we hear a lot about that at the federal level now. But at the state level, I think half of all states actually created tax reform commissions to look at this question or performance review commissions on the expenditure side of the budget. Um, the only thing is that fundamental tax reform is hard at all levels of government um, because there's always going to be winners and losers. So I'm actually sitting on a tax reform commission now in the District of Columbia where you know, we are just getting started, but it's becoming very clear anytime you talk about changing something slightly, much less adopting a whole new revenue source, you know, that can be very, very difficult. So I can understand why a lot of states did these temporary increases like you did in Nevada, um, just like a temporary pay cut, because it gives you some flexibility going forward. Is there any shining star state that did seem Not to really. A lot of states really. did things like increase sale, uh, sales taxes on cigarettes and alcohol, right? So that's this idea that um, the old saying, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. Um, you know, sin taxes, um, sin taxes, you know, you have to kind of keep increasing them because they're often per unit that's sold as opposed to the price of the good. So the price of the good goes up and you're not capturing any of that. Um, so you're sort of, uh, you know, you're running in to stay in place. You, uh, you have to, it's, it's not necessarily the most efficient tax for a number of reasons. Also falls on a very narrow portion of the population. So 
um, you know, there was talk about states really, well, for example, some, some fundamental reforms would be things like thinking about the sales tax and how it applies to an increasingly narrow portion of the economy. So we used to be predominantly a goods producing economy, now we're predominantly a service producing economy. The idea that you get taxed when you buy a lawnmower from Home Depot, but not when you pay a kid to mow your lawn, seems kind of strange, right? It's inefficient because that's basically the same output your lawn is getting mowed. Um, and it's also kind of inequitable because it's higher income people that are more likely to pay for the service as opposed to buying the good to produce the outcome. Um, but woe be to any governor that tries to extend the sales tax to services. So Jennifer Granholm in Michigan tried to do that and was basically forced to repeal that. Um, in Maryland, where I used to work, the governor um, tried to do that, but basically every professional service, like doctors and lawyers, they were in there saying, well, don't tax me, you know, tax that other guy. And the other guy happened to be computer services. They just weren't in the room at the time. So we ended up with this very lopsided sales tax on services, the one service industry that we were trying to build in the state. So, so that was repealed after a little while. So it just, it's, it's very hard to do fundamental tax reform um, in, in a good way. And, I, and unfortunately, I can't think of a state that's a shiny example of, of really you know, fantastic uh, new taxes. But I do applaud the number of states that have formed these commissions to at least put out you know, good analyses and give lawmakers a series of options, and, and the public a series of options. I want to get someone new. Yes. Mm -hmm. higher education and health, et cetera. And I was struck more by the states that didn't cut than the ones that did. Mm -hmm. And there were a smaller number of them, but there were still more number. And I'm wondering if uh, you have any investigation or any conclusions about the ways they protected some of those. Mm -hmm. Were they in better shape financially? Or did mm -hmm. they just make different decisions? Mm -hmm. Or did they actually enact some kind of a tax structure? Revenue yeah. Structure? You know, I, the way that I think of it, almost all states, um, well, North Dakota I mean, definitely right. has that, that so, yeah, Right. So a lot of states had natural resources. You know, I mean, one of the reasons it's so great to do work in this area is because all states are different. All local governments are even more different. They're different in terms of the costs that they face, um, the types of populations that they have to cover, the costs of labor and other inputs to those um, services, and they differ in the resources that they have available to tax. So states like North Dakota, and Texas, um, you know, avoided a lot of the bust because they they had these natural resources, um, and they had income coming from that um, in the economy as well as revenues. Um, but you know, I look at this and, and I'm struck by how many states cut K to 12 education and colleges, and universities, and K to 12 uh, even you know as as the federal funds were coming in, which which moderated some of that in terms of the effects. To be to be fair, um, and healthcare. Um, Employee compensation, you know, almost all states went after that. So, um, you know, I, I think cuts were pretty widespread. The numbers, I would have to go back and look at the handful of states that didn't cut in these areas. And I would bet if they didn't cut in one area, then they probably were cutting actively in the other area. Question. Was there something intentional about mm -hmm. what was being protected, or is it just by happenstance? Was it value driven, mm -hmm. or was it revenue driven? Or and these are exactly the kinds of questions that motivate my research, is, is trying to get into. Um, you know, what were the demographics, what were the costs in these states, and, and then what were the outcomes, and can we trace that back to things like the political dynamics in the state or the institutions. Maybe some states had a stricter balanced budget rule than other states did. Um, so those are all kind of testable hypotheses that I hope to look at going forward. Yep. Yes. The state of Oregon did something unusual where they knew that they had a limited amount of health care yep. dollars. So they held a lottery on who would get health care for that year. And I believe they've done this mm -hmm. three rounds now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any feedback on that, positive, negative? OK, is this the so this is, where I, <laughs> this is where I out myself as a, um, as a research geek. But um, so it, wasn't a, it was a lottery. So a lot of public programs are oversubscribed, like public housing, for example. And so you have a wait list, and you sort of you know, randomly get people off of the wait list. And so I'm not sure exactly how they did it in, in Oregon. but. Um, I don't think it was quite as stark as, you know, you, you sort of, you, you get health care, you don't get health care. Um, I imagine they tried to do something rotating so that they were taking care of people. On the other hand, the fact that it was random, who got it and who didn't, opens up all these research opportunities, right? And so there are actually some, some fantastic papers looking at how 
access to access to healthcare, not necessarily healthcare, but insurance through Medicaid, really did save people's lives. Um, so, so you know, the 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 fact that they were constrained and they had to do something ended up um, providing opportunity to show the value of some of these programs. Yeah. Do you see that as a future? Is the, that a way to to the lottery distribute? Idea? X amount of dollars? Well, or there's, a, there's always rationing that happens, right? So, um, so things like cutting, um, oops, like cutting uh, non medical vision, right? So, the idea was that the state would cut that in one year, but then restore it the next year. Um, so, it's not necessarily, you know, saying to people, you get health care, you don't get health care. It's not death panels and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's basically trying to choose a service that's not so it's not if you're showing up in the emergency room and you have some horrible you know life-threatening eye condition I don't know what that would be um, but it is saying if you I mean think about you know all of us if we don't visit the dentist in a couple of years you know and it's not a medical issue then it's sort of okay um, you know in some cases cutting things like non-medical vision and dental might be the least worst alternative that's available to you um, I don't see them going after even things like Medicaid, you know, there are certain mandatory populations that are covered, and so we're talking about things that states were doing to try to be more generous than what's required by the federal government, and then realizing, you know, we just don't have the money to do that anymore. Um, so, and of course, all of this is off the table now with health care reform because there's going to be more uniformity, um, except for the states that opt out, and I frankly don't think that that will be very many states. <laughs> Have you done any studies where you have compared by county the federal spending by county versus the federal taxes by county mm -hmm. to an estimate to see the donor and receptor mm -hmm. uh, type counties? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's often talked about at the state level. Um, and I know that during the recession, um, Governor Schwarzenegger, you know, periodically governors kind of get upset about this and they say, I'm going to go to Washington and tell them to give us back our tax money. Um, and some of this is available at a lower level of geography. There's a website called usaspending.gov. Um, in fact, it's a, I think it's all still there. There are other sources that used to be available that unfortunately got cut in the federal budget um, from the Census Bureau, so it's a little bit ironic. Um, but, uh, but the only problem with arguing that you don't want to be a donor state anymore is that what makes you a recipient state is basically having more low-income people who qualify for benefits, um, having more federal land, uh, having you know, an Air Force base, that kind of stuff. So that's what determines states that get a lot of money from the federal government. But uh, in some ways, it's a sign of success that you're a donor state, right? It means you have more high-income people, um, and that's, that's, that's our social compact. That's the federalist system. Um, but I understand, you know, in bad years, it's tempting to look at that balance and say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to be, I don't want to be cross-subsidizing other people. And that's exactly, by the way, what's happening in Europe right now, right, is that some countries are saying, I don't want to bail out um, those guys in Greece. So it's a very touchy Germany. issue. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um. One of the graphs you put up, and you had mentioned uh, elsewhere, that uh, the, the government spending accounted for roughly a, a third of a percent of GDP growth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, which sounds like pretty close ratio for the amount of tax revenue that's collected as well, uh, like as a percent. Um, so uh, a third of growth versus about 37 percent of Sorry, it was, a, it was a third of a percentage point? And then the average growth rate is about three percent, so, so it's more like, it, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Right. And then I was also wondering if, if uh, throughout states or within the local municipalities, if there is solid evidence that um, that shows that bigger government uh, is a problem, because there's all these discussions about, well, we need to shrink government. I think yeah. the idea of that is we're all paying money for it, mm -hmm. so we want a better deal, so mm -hmm. we want mm -hmm. smaller. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, since growth comes from some of that government spending, mm -hmm. I wonder. Right. So, so I think the key is that. Um, let's see if I can get to this graph. I think the key is that state and local governments, the types of spending that they do, often is the type of spending that contributes to growth. Right. So things like K to twelve and higher education or highways. I mean, these are all the things that um, you know infrastructure spending. Um, it's uncertain exactly how it contributes to growth, and we wish we had better estimates. It's a tough thing to nail down. Um, 
but you know, these are the decisions that shape the, the future of the economy. Um, so the idea that state and local governments are cutting those, that, that's concerning for the long term, you know, not just the short term in terms of job cuts and, that, and as you point out, you know, sort of those negative, not that 0.33 percentage points, but those negative bars on that graph. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think it's not a question of big versus small. I think several politicians have said this. It's a question of sort of good versus bad government, right, or quality um, government. And so, again, you know, I'm just, um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to see, and in Nevada, too, I think you do some performance-based budgeting, I think, for certain sections of the state budget, like public safety. Even just the, the act of collecting outcomes and trying to define, you know, what the purpose of these programs are can lead to a more rational conversation, you know, and people getting informed. and more and more of this information, you know, being available on the web and being able to have conversations about, you know, why is spending growing? Is it growing because of demographics, which are largely, you know, unavoidable? That's just sort of who we are as a state or because of policy decisions that we're making and then perhaps we want to undo those decisions. Those are the kinds of dialogues I think need to happen right now. On your chart, it's predicting the future, or uh, not the future, but the uh, value of the house versus the assessed value. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that your numbers started dipping in 2004 mm -hmm. and bottomed out in 2008. Was that because there was a glut of new houses on the market that reduced overall costs starting in 2004? Or so were we I think this <coughs> is the, the bright blue line that you're talking about. That's yeah. the tax rate. So, oh, I'm sorry, how, what was the market value, the dark blue? Yes. Okay, never mind, I, yeah. missed, I got my blue. So, but it's, <laughs> but it's, I'm glad you called attention to it because I think it is a really interesting dynamic that there's a lot of pressure on the property tax when real estate values are increasing because people are being assessed at, with some delay, the orange line, they're being assessed on this new um, presumed value of their home, but they haven't actually sold their home. They haven't realized that gain. And so that's why there's often political pressure when real estate values go up to cut the rate um, so that people don't pay higher taxes. Um, but that's, that's very tough on local governments because local governments derive 75% of their tax income from the property tax across the country, 45% of general revenue from the property tax. And in general, the property tax is a really good tax because it can be flexible like this. You can change the rate. And so the idea of creating all these constraints like caps or limits on increases in assessed value really robs local governments of their one main tool to manage their finances and manage their service delivery. Um, but I think you know, the dynamic that you identify, the interplay between market values and rates is exactly what puts a lot of pressure on that revenue source and that's important to understand. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it was interesting, you're, you're, almost everybody that I've ever seen in talking about the size of government, you know, you said about the really uh, looking at that. I know Professor Friedman did a lot of things on that, and everybody seems to hit that 20% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of GDP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that has been a big historical average. Right, uh, and, right. And uh, I had an idea where we would put that 20% GDP spending limit and 10% for entitlements. Right. So you'd have a 10% non-entitlement. Right. And uh, I guess Utah has a constitutional amendment they want to hit 18%, so of right. course they want to be lower. Right. They're actually pushing a federal constitutional amendment. But anyway, so I just never understood that, that argument at the federal level, and it's not exactly, you know, <coughs> but at the state level too. There, there's, yeah. a, there's a book called The Price of Government, which suggests that the historical average of spending as a share of GDP is X, and therefore that is what voters are willing to pay for government. But that's a, that, that reflects a, a, a accumulation of policy choices, right, about tax rates and bases. And, uh, you know, I think the better way to have that conversation is to look at, especially at the federal level, to look at these obligations that we now have, to look at the money that we have coming in and decide what we want to do with those obligations and decide, you know, if it's worth raising more revenue. So the idea of looking backwards at the historical average doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, it's sort of like a household saying, well, our kids are going to college next year and this is what income I expect to make, um, as opposed to this is how much income we've made for the past decade, um, and let's just spend that, you know? I think I saw a hand back there, yes. Do you see any potential contribution of uh, modifying the tax structure of the uh, mining sector, <laughs> especially <laughs> the mother? The, I'm sorry, the, the mining, mining sector, sector. yeah. So I've, I've heard a lot of talk about how um, people feel that's an unexploited revenue source. 
Um, and the thing about, um, you know, in general in tax policy, I think we've talked about sort of footloose industries and, and the problem of taxing industries that might move away. Um, to the extent that you can tax stuff that doesn't move away just by the general criteria of taxation, you know, that's a good thing. Um, a lot of states have severance taxes on, you know, mining or oil or other types of, you know, natural resource extraction. Um, so, you know, every state has to sort of do what's right based on its values and its political considerations. Um, I know that, uh, you know, there are other states that, that do tax those resources more. I'm not quite sure of the history in Nevada and, you know, why it hasn't gone after that. Um, but I know that's very much of an issue. And, and I think they did increase those taxes slightly, actually, to be fair, in the last two um, biennial uh, sessions. Um, so, um, you know, again, though, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a narrow segment of the economy. Um, you know, my preferred solution is always to try to do something broad so that you can have a pretty low rate. Um, so some kind of diverse solution would always be the best thing to do. Yeah, I think um, the Abbey Dunlap matter is under this circumstance of this, uh, I think, any effort to diversify the yep. sources of the revenue yep. will yeah. actually matter. Yeah, and if you can do it in such a way that you're not forcing industries out of the state, then that's, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't usually do this, but if I could get the last question. Uh, we have 50 state governments, right? Uh -huh. and I, I think I heard you mention earlier uh, when we were talking, not here, but the, the number of local government entities in yes. the nation. Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, we live in a small state, obviously, right? We don't have, but think about it nationally. You want to throw out a number? 30, Ooh. 2,500. There's no prize. So <laughs> <laughs> 89,000. So, yeah. So a lot of those are special entities, um, special districts that provide just one service. Um, that's probably very prevalent in Nevada. I didn't check the numbers by state, but um, so you know there are there are about oh gosh 3,000. I'm not going to get this right. There are there are there are about 30,000 municipalities, um, townships, cities, um, and I think a comparable number of. Uh, I'm not going to get this right. You're putting me on the spot. Uh, 89,000 total, but a lot of those are special purpose entities that have just one responsibility like mosquito abatement or fire protection. Um, but the rise of those special purpose governments is very interesting because they don't necessarily correspond to what we think of as city and county boundaries. Um, and you could have somebody living in several jurisdictions at once and not realizing that they're paying taxes to several jurisdictions until they suddenly do and they say, wait a minute, what's going on here? So that fragmentation is a very big issue. But if you're curious about this kind of stuff, I can't say enough good things about the Census Bureau whose budget keeps getting cut, um, <laughs> census.gov, and the Census of Government's website has all of these little fun facts about the number of, of local government entities in the United States. So. That's right. And county, mm -hmm. that would be considered a special district? No, 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 no. Okay. It's, it's a different thing entirely. But counties, oftentimes, because they're not cities and they don't provide the whole panoply of services, they'll have special districts within the county, or you could have a special district within a city as well that's just charged with one thing, like um, housing or a hospital district. Um, Oftentimes it's a way to borrow in order to build these kinds of facilities, but not have the general government on the hook. So that's a whole other question. So what was the number? Uh, 89,000. 89,000? 89,500, I think, to be. Congratulations yeah. to the gentleman who came through. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you Thank you all much. for joining us. Before you run out, our, our next lecture is next Tuesday evening. Uh, John Banks will be joining us. He's a foreign policy expert from Brookings, but, a, but also an energy expert. He's going to talk to us about U.S. energy policy the last few decades and how it is, or maybe more importantly, how it isn't being addressed in the current election. We, we, we've altered our days and times for lectures to try and accommodate more people, so the next lecture is next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Hope we can see you there. Same time of night as the presidential debate. It might, it might be.